Thank you for joining today's webinar on optimizing drug development with model-informed decision-making. Today, I'm delighted to introduce my colleague, Tina Cecchio, Senior Associate Strategic Consulting at Cytel, our, as our webinar presenter today. At Cytel, Tina specializes in providing clinical pharmacology and pharmacometrics consulting, as well as model development and application. Tina obtained her PhD in Nutritional Sciences from the University of Connecticut, where she modeled the impact of dietary or drug-induced fluctuations in insulin on high-density lipoprotein metabolism. Tina started her career as a clinical research associate at Newark Beth Israel Medical Center. From there, she transitioned to Pfizer, where she initially worked on preclinical pharmacokinetic and dynamic studies in the cardiovascular and metabolic disease area for five years, and then transitioned to clinical pharmacology before moving into a formal pharmacometrics position. She has contributed to summaries of clinical pharmacology and of clinical safety for several submissions and has used modeling and simulation to, <clears throat> excuse me, to enhance drug development plans and define key decision milestones. In today's webinar, Tina will highlight areas that are frequently supported by pharmacometrics modeling and simulation with a focus on the ways that strategic applications of pharmacometrics approaches may be used to increase confidence at critical development milestones. I will now hand over to Tina for the presentation. Thank you, Cecilia, for that introduction, and hello, everybody. Thank you for joining. Um, today, I'm going to talk to you about a topic that's very near and dear to my heart, which is using model and sim modeling and simulation to help um, make decisions that we come across as people that work in clinical development. And um, <clears throat> part of the reason I'm very excited about this is because over the past 21 years, I've had the opportunity to work with very many gifted and many, many talented scientists who often know their discipline so well that they can almost intuit what's going to happen in their drug development programs. So it's really rewarding when you can use a model to help support their intuition. But even the most gifted and talented team will eventually run into some places where the decisions that they need to make are less able to be intuitive and <clears throat> there might be a lot of ambiguity. So sometimes there could be two or more very reasonable options going forward and a team may not necessarily know what to do. But more often there are instances where there are uncertain choices or less than optimal options, and the path may not be as clear cut. So what I'm going to talk to you about is how you can use modeling and simulation to help remove some of that ambiguity around the decisions. And so um, this talk, I guess, would primarily appeal to people who unfortunately have never had the chance to see this in action before or who are working on teams where they just have not yet been supported by modeling and simulation to give you a kind of feel for what it can do for you. So the first thing we're going to talk about is what it is exactly. What is model-informed drug development? And basically, it's just a quantitative enhancement that allows us to use modeling and simulation to reduce risks that, come across, that we all come across working in clinical development. Basically, what I'm talking about is building models that reflect the observed data with regard to the underlying disease processes and how the body systems work together, as well as the drug characteristics. And then with these models, we use them to understand some of the variability that happens in these responses. Um, <clears throat> one of the big things, though, is that it tries when we do these models, we are trying to increase our understanding of the drug and the body's response to the drug in its totality. So we use diverse data. We use data from preclinical studies and from clinical studies. We, we will be willing to use data from um, the entire range across the drug's development to help us understand what's really happening. And again, the goals of these models are to help decrease uncertainty and lower failure, failure rates in our clinical trials. Importantly, we also like to use models when we come to places in clinical development that we know we need some information that we couldn't generate experimentally. So um, the hope is that the model can help fill in the gap for what you can't directly observe. So importantly, um, 
<clears throat> model the use of modeling and simulation has shown to be so effective at times that our government actually recognizes it in the Prescription Drug User Fee Amendments Act. And basically, what this act is is a commitment by the American government to its people that we will use whatever methods we can in an appropriate way. We're not going to do this haphazardly, but we'll use whatever methods we can to help shorten the amount of time that it takes to get a very good drug into the hands of the people who need it. So um, one of the ways that has been proposed can help shorten this time through drug development and through the review process is by using modeling and simulation. And this is stemming from the belief that model-informed drug development can help streamline or accelerate the development of new products. So just to kind of calm any nerves that people might have around this, um, I myself am going to give you some examples of the types of decisions that it, the agencies have accepted that were um, that had utilized modeling and simulation to help support those decisions. And they include changes in trial design or proposed trial designs. Um, they also include demonstrating the need or the lack of a need for an additional clinical trial or for different doses that perhaps had not yet been studied. Um, they also include proposing to use smaller sample sizes, the selection of dosing recommendations, the duration of studies, and the different populations. So all of these types of decisions, we at Cytel have direct experience knowing that you can use modeling and simulation and that it will be many times very often accepted by the regulatory agencies. But it goes deeper than the fact that the agencies have accepted these things in the past because in all of their combined knowledge, they're able to recommend to us the places in clinical development where modeling and simulation is particularly effective, and not only is it effective, but where they would like to see us using modeling and simulation if it's appropriate for our project. <clears throat> and these areas include identifying the target concentrations of drugs or helping to describe the therapeutic windows for our new compounds. They also include examining drug-drug interactions um, optimizing the doses, especially in fragile populations like pediatrics, um, ensuring safety for different populations. Importantly, they, they recommend that we use modeling and simulation to support our understanding of QTC relationships and enhancing different trial designs. So these are places that have been um, highlighted by the agencies as being particularly well supported by modeling and simulation. And again, with the suggestion that we try to use these, these approaches in these areas wherever possible. And this is coming from the belief, again, that if you successfully ap apply a model and you do it in an appropriate way, you could have it result in smaller or shorter clinical trials. And also, it could lead you then to carry out fewer post-marketing studies. So where is this all coming from? Now this, this statistic is a little bit old. I would say it's about five years old. But um, at the time, what was noted was that only 16 out of every 100 drugs that entered the phase one ever actually make it to FDA approval. And that begs the question of whether or not there are things that we as an industry could be doing better. Um, in what areas should we be focusing as, on as an industry to help incre increase the success rate? So um, for this, many different teams have tried to study this to understand what's going on. And what I want to show you is this table. Um, the numbers in the table are coming from the analysis that the authors did, and that's not the part I really want you to focus on. What this table is showing you in the top section are the top 10 reasons that drugs that were in phase two don't successfully cross from phase two to phase three. And the bottom section of this table is telling you the top 10 reasons that drugs that are in phase three don't successfully make it to submission. And when you look at these reasons, what you can note 
is that a good majority of the reasons, including endpoint selection, a team's ability to complete a trial, the use of placebo controls, sample size, the population, and even the length of the study are all areas which lend themselves particularly well to using modeling and simulation to get extra evidence that your team is making the right decisions about the study design and about the study itself. And with regard to trial outcome, what the authors meant by that term was whether or not the trial completed and had a positive outcome for the primary endpoint. So let me show you now another area where this is really important that we can use modeling and simulation to help support. Um, <clears throat> what this figure is looking at is the reasons that um, drugs fail in phase two. And you can see, if you look at this, that 51% of the time it was estimated that drugs are failing because they are not showing efficacy. And that might not be very surprising for a compound in phase two because phase two is where you start to demonstrate proof of concept. However, if a drug does successfully move through phase two to phase three, it tends to mean that the clinical team that was developing that drug had reason to believe that it would be beneficial to the patients they're trying to treat. Yet, if we look at the reasons for failures in phase three, what we see again is that the vast majority of drugs are failing to progress, again, because of efficacy, not because of any safety findings that weren't picked up during phase two. Um, it certainly is happening, but by far, the biggest reason that drugs are failing is still related to efficacy. So that begs the question of whether or not we were really optimizing the use of the data that we had collected during phase too, and was it used to ask the right questions, such as were we um, targeting the right indication, the right population, and importantly, did we select the right dose to go forward? So these types of questions lend themselves particularly well to the type of modeling that I'm going to talk about, and that is one of the reasons that we would like teams to start considering using modeling and simulation as a tool to help support their decisions. Now, it's easy to see that modeling and simulation could be um, an important tool, but it's less easy to know how and when to actually incorporate these approaches in your clinical development plan, especially if you've never seen it before. So what I want to do is give you an example and kind of give you a feel for what you could expect if you were going to try to attempt this. The first thing is that you should expect that this is not going to happen in a silo. It's a multidisciplined approach, and it's trying to accomplish a really big task because you're trying to relate your understanding of the disease state and human physiology with different drug characteristics and with inter-individual vari variability in response. So there's a lot of different moving parts, and it often requires the expertise from multiple people. Um, it also is trying to pool together data from multiple sources. So you want to use the data across all of the different patients and the studies and the development phases to try to get as comprehensive a picture as possible. Now, these types of models could be very, very small, simple models that have very little assumptions to them, um, like a traditional statistical model that you might see in some of the clinical studies, but they can also go the full gamut to the other direction for fully mechanistic approaches like you might see in a quantitative systems pharmacological approach. Um, <clears throat> you might often see that for large molecules and biological agents, but there could be reason that you might want to take an approach like that in your, in your studies as well. Um, but importantly, it requires the input from clinicians and pharmacologists and statisticians all working together to make sure that the model that's being proposed is reasonable and has a certain amount of confidence that it's going to reflect what's actually happening. So these models can take many, many different structures and many different shapes. You may not see this exact format, but what will often happen is that the modeler on your team will propose something and they may bring it to you in the math shorthand like I'm showing here. 
the math shorthand could be very intimidating, especially if you haven't had reason to think in these terms for a long time. But really what the modeler is trying to ask you is whether or not the model that they're proposing reflects um, the, the biology as your team understands it. So what they're really trying to tell you um, by giving you something like this is that any individual response could be reflected by a person's baseline response, meaning how sick they were at the beginning of the trial or where they were in their disease state, plus the effect of being in a clinical trial, which um, most people refer to it as a placebo effect. And um, mostly what the modeler is trying to do here is they're trying to account for changes in a person's health that could happen just by nature of participating in a study. So an example I like to give is that if a person is a diabetic and they start a clinical trial, for the duration of the trial, they may be having um, <clears throat> their diet monitored and their exercise monitored and their therapies, any agents that they're taking to help control their diabetes may be heavily re regulated. And because of that, they may actually experience an improvement in their health that has nothing to do with whether or not they actually receive the test drug. But a good modeler is going to try to account for that and for any placebo that is actually delivered in their model. And then there's also going to be somewhere in their equations something that accounts for the effect of being on the test drug. And lastly, there will be a measurement of the type of variability that you could expect in the response. So although the forms that you see of the model may be different and there may be more um, moving pieces than what I'm showing you here, ultimately these are the pieces of information that the modeler is trying to capture. And then using each of the different components, the modeler as well as the team can decide which areas they want to focus on. So for example, if your team wants to understand a little bit more about the placebo effect, they would focus on understanding that portion of the equation and they would use it to answer particular questions. So some of the types of questions that a person might want to address would be how long should we run in the placebo so that they can equilibrate any possible placebo effect effect across all of the patients on the study, or how much of an effect could you expect to see that's related to the placebo alone, or just how much does the endpoint vary from day to day, even in the absence of any intervention that you deliver on your study. But a lot of times the teams aren't very interested in the placebo effect, or it may already be pretty well understood, and so the teams instead will ask the modelers to focus on understanding the drug effect. And so they'll focus then on the part of the equation that really understands and highlights how the drug responds. <clears throat> I'm sorry, how the body responds to the drug. And they might be asking questions like, what is the effect of the test drug or the test biological agent above and beyond the placebo effect? Or how long does it take to see a maximum response? Or what is the maximum response we could expect? Or can we use a dose that we did not yet study? That's a question that often comes up over clinical development, and that is why you would focus on this portion of the equation. So now let me show you what it might look like in action. Um, <clears throat> we had a client come to us who was interested in using receptor occupancy as a surrogate indicator for efficacy. Receptor occupancy for them um, meant it was a measurement of how many receptors on the cell surface were engaging with their test drug. And they were using it because they had an understanding that the more receptors that were engaged, the more um, efficacious the response was. So there was a hope that they could use receptor occupancy to help plan the doses for a dose-ranging study. And luckily for the team, they did have some available human data. The catch was that all of the available human data that was available came from healthy volunteers. And the reason that that was a concern is because their preclinical studies suggested that there could be a difference in the receptor occupancy between healthy and diseased subjects. 
So this um, caused the team to pause and to question whether or not they could use receptor occupancy to help them guide the doses for the dose ranging study. And <clears throat> in the end, what was hypothesized was that you could use that information provided that you could scale between mice and humans and between healthy and disease states. And that's exactly what our modeler did. <clears throat> so what you're looking at now are the results of her efforts. Um, the light blue line shows what a model predicted would happen in a healthy volunteer based off of the mice and observed human data. And the red dots that you see here are what actually happened. So what you can see is that the model was fairly well able to predict what happened um, when they put the test drug into healthy humans. Using that model and using the scaling factors that were obtained from the preclinical studies, our modeler then adjusted to see what was predicted to be the response in um, disease subjects. And that's showing up here in the dark blue line. So this is what was predicted. And what you can see is that based on the model predictions, we would expect to see that the dose response would shift to the left, meaning that lower doses would be needed to obtain the maximum response or um, ED50, which is the 50% response in the disease subjects. Now, to make sure that the model was on target, the team did an interim analysis, and they were collecting the interim analysis for multiple reasons, but they did want to confirm the understanding from the model. And so what you're seeing, although there were small sample sizes, these purple circles show the response in the diseased individuals, and you can see that the model did a fairly good job of predicting what would likely happen. So this is an example of a team who came with a very direct question, um, wanting to understand the dose response in disease individuals. But when the modeling was um, taking place, they actually got a little bit more information than what they originally asked for. So I'm going to highlight for you what else they learned. The first thing is that they learned a little bit about the baseline response in both healthy and diseased individuals and were able to quantify the difference between the two. They also learned a lot about the drug, the drug effect beyond just the ED50, because now they have kind of a measurement or a quantification, if you will, of the maximum effect they could expect to see. They identified the linear response for the linear dose response range, and they were able to show the range at which the effect was saturated. And this is a really important area because this is an area where you can increase the dose of your drug without seeing any additional clinical benefit for your patient, although you may be inadvertently increasing the risk of adverse events. So that is an area where you may want to stay away from and you probably want to shift all of the doses going forward in development to be on the lower side of the spectrum. And then lastly, they got um, some information, a quantification of how much variability they could expect to see in response. And a lot of people at first may not really recognize the power behind understanding that. Now I'm going to show you how you can use that later on to go and um, actually help you make decisions about strategy. So that brings me to the next point, which is that there are many, many different ways that you can use a quantitative approach to help your drug development plan. It extends far beyond exposure response modeling. Um, basically, the sky's the limit if you really think about it. Now, I'm going to tell you about the methods that we currently do here at Cytel, but remember that there are many, many applications of these different types of modeling and simulation approaches. So for us, the first thing is that we would review a drug development plan and look for places that could be enhanced or places where there may be gaps in your knowledge where you might want to support it using some type of quantitative approach. Um, the next thing is to consider using translational biology. And what this is is an approach that allows us to scale between species. So moving from one species to another 
we're moving from preclinical species to humans. And this type of information goes in both directions. So you can use your preclinical data to help inform your clinical trials, and vice versa, you can take information from your clinical trials and feed it back to your preclinical teams so that they have better information for any follow-on compounds that might come down the road. Once you begin testing in humans, there are two other types of modeling that are frequently employed, one called non-compartmental analysis, the other called population pharmacokinetics, or POP-PK. And these two types of modeling approaches are different, but they have the same end goal of helping to describe the relationship between the dose and then the body's exposure to the compound. And although they take two different approaches, when you combine the two approaches together, what ends up happening is you have a very comprehensive understanding of the factors that drive the exposure at any one moment in time. Now, that can be really important in informing your label in terms of different populations, the food effect, different formulations, drug-drug interactions. But it can also be really important that you have this information, particularly from a POP-PK model, because it can help, um, help you understand what type of exposure you might have at any moment, any given moment in time. So if you're unable to measure something directly, using a POP-PK model, you could probably estimate the exposure that um, a person or a series of patients were likely experiencing at a moment in time. And that can help you make decisions about your dosing intervals and um, about safety effects or help you understand things that may not be particularly clear. Um, importantly, there's another type of modeling called model-based meta-analysis. And this is an approach that allows us to use data that has been published in the literature. Um, it's particularly useful when you need to understand something that you don't have direct experience with. So, for example, you may not have individual level data for different compounds that are interesting to you or for a placebo effect. It may not be um, ethical to measure someone on placebo for a long period of time. And it may be, though, that these effects had previously been studied. And so there might be information in the literature that you would like to use to help inform your decisions. Now, most of the time when we take data from the literature, we can only use what the authors reported, which is usually a mean effect or a mean observation. So there are some statistical considerations that need to be applied to the data to make it valid for your own internal use. And this type of modeling allows you to do that. And then the last type of modeling is kind of very similar to what I just talked about, which is exposure response modeling. It's also referred to as PKPD, and that helps us understand the relationship between the exposure to a drug or a biological agent and then the response that we observe. Taking all of these different approaches together can really help enhance your development program and maybe um, take some of the uncertainty out of the decisions you need to make. But the part that I really want to highlight is um, how we can use this not just to understand the underlying physiology, but how we can use it to make strategic decisions about our studies. And for that, I'd like to give a different type of example. Remember that I told you earlier that this is going to show you how understanding the variability in, in a response could actually lend itself to making strategic decisions. So this is an actual situation. It's a client from Large Pharma who came and needed a little bit of help because they were at an impasse in their drug development program. They had um, a very, very strong biomarker that had a high correlation with the effic efficacy endpoint. And um, <clears throat> the good thing about the biomarker, what made it very lucrative to use, was that it was very easy to measure and that you were able to detect a signal very early on into your studies, whereas the clinical registration endpoint took several months before you could measure a change. So um, it, whenever a team needed to use the clinical registration endpoint, they knew that they would be facing a very 
large, long clinical trial. And this caused a little bit of an impasse when it came down to designing P the POC study for phase two, the formal POC study. So the team had an agreement that they would definitely conduct a phase 1B proof of concept study based on the biomarker. There was no uh, discrepancy. The entire team was in agreement to go that way. But what was under debate was whether or not they should conduct a second phase 1B dose finding study that would be based on the biomarker. So proponents who, decide, who were against conducting an additional small study believed that you should go from phase 1B um, from the POC study straight to phase 2. Um, they believed it because it would allow them to study the clinical registration endpoint directly, but <clears throat> it would cause them to need a very, very large sample size, over 100 subjects, and it would take a long time for this study to read out. On the other hand, there were proponents who believed that you should do a phase 1B dose finding study that was based on the biomarker because they shared a belief that they could potentially eliminate doses that were not likely to be of clinical interest and therefore they would be able to shorten to shorten the next study and also recruit less subjects. So there were pros and cons to each approach and they didn't exactly know which way to go. So what our modeler did was they used the, their understanding of what the variability in the response would be to simulate the outcomes of different trials under each scenario. And what you're looking at over here is a box plot of the different scenarios under option A, which means that they would go directly to phase two versus the outcomes of doing an additional study. Now the green boxes at the top show the number of times, or the, I'm sorry, the percentage of times that the team would have correctly chosen to continue to progress the compound and would have selected the correct dose. The blue area in the box shows the number of times that the team would have chosen to progress the compound but would have selected an inappropriate dose. And the red boxes show the number of times that the team would have chosen to terminate the compound. And what you can see here is that based on the simulations, which in turn were based off of the understanding of the variability in the response, that either option, option A or option B, was equally valid, that there wasn't a very strong distinction between the two. And that means that the decision for whether to use option A or option B can really come down to logistics or budget or some other qualifying factor that the team had to face. However, the modeling exercise also showed that in either scenario, there was only approximately a 50% chance that the team would make the right decision and choose the right dose to move forward. And so even though these two options were equally um, valid comparing to each other, both options were uncomfortable options for the clinical team, and they wanted to know how they could increase the likelihood that they would make the right decision and choose the right dose going forward. So what our modeler did was then say if they took the budget from the proposed phase 1B study and applied it to increasing the sample size in the formal pivotal proof of concept study, what would happen to the likelihood that the team would make the right decision and choose the right dose? And so on the x-axis here, you can see various sample sizes, and you can see how this green bar is getting bigger and bigger and bigger as the sample size goes up, meaning that as the sample size got bigger, the likelihood that the team would make the right decision and choose the right dose was increasing. And so this exercise new showed that even though there was a very, very high correlation between the biomarker and the endpoint, in this scenario, the team had a higher probability of making the right decision and the most and picking the most appropriate dose if they increased sample size rather than if they conducted a separate phase 1B study. 
So this is an example now of where you can take your understanding, which is based off of the observed data, and it is based off of the, um, it's based off of how you understand your disease process and how you understand the body's response to your agent, whether it's a biological agent or a drug, but then feed it into what is likely to happen in the next trial or the next series of trials. So it shows you another way to apply this information to help make a decision. So <clears throat> a lot of times, though, what we hear is that Sometimes people will say, oh, that would be nice to do, but we really can't afford to build a model or there's not enough time. So what I'd like to now ask people to do is think about this in terms of the big picture. What are the consequences of moving forward in a drug development program when you don't necessarily have a robust understanding of the population and the indication and the dose, and you don't necessarily understand how your study design is going to affect the decisions that you make. So first and foremost, as scientists, the first thing you have to think of is what are the consequences to the patient? And um, imagining now that you fail to demonstrate POC, not because your drug isn't an efficacious drug, but because maybe you used the wrong dose or maybe you used an ineffective study design. Well, one of the consequences then is that patients moving forward could be denied access to a good drug because your information was too ambiguous to help you make the right choice. Um, and when these results are ambiguous, there's the other side too, that you could make a choice to continue to progress your compound, but you could pick an ineffective dose, and then you could be putting that into larger populations of people. But aside from the consequences to the patient, there's also consequences directly to your company and to your team. There's a financial impact for a failed POC study, and these are older numbers. This is coming from um, a few years ago, but estimates for a failed, a failed POC study range from $800 million to $1.4 billion. So when you think about that and you put it in the context of um, having had a little bit of additional support from going through the modeling exercise, it seems like, it, it seems more obvious that you should try when you can and when you have the right data, you should try to make the most use of it as possible. Now, to show you the flip side of this, there is a certain cost savings that are associated with making these decisions. And this is older data, okay? This is coming from 2014, and what you're looking at is a table of um, different indications that in one year, the same calendar year, Pfizer submitted for approval to the agencies. So in these nine areas, Pfizer submitted a drug in 2014 to the agencies for approval. And what study teams were asked was to identify whether or not modeling and simulation approaches were used during the drug's development. And if the answer was yes, they were then asked to estimate um, these three metrics. Were any patients spared as a result of the modeling and simulation? In other words, were you able to reduce sample size? If so, how many? Was any time saved? Did you eliminate a study? Did you eliminate doses? Did you eliminate study arms? Were you able to stop your study earlier? Um, these were all, um, the teams were asked to give an estimate for how much time was saved during clinical development. Or did the modeling and simulation um, increase the probability of success of a trial? And success of a trial wasn't defined as having the outcome that Pfizer hoped. Success of the trial was defined as your ability to make a very clear, strong decision um, for your project team. Then the numbers that were pooled from the Pfizer teams were taken to an independent institute who took them and then estimated the financial impact for each team for having had done that. And together, it is estimated that over the development of these nine compounds, um, Pfizer use of modeling and simulation techniques saved the company about $874 million. So not only is the cost savings 
in terms of not failing your POC studies, but it's also in terms of what it could mean for your drug development program as a whole. So having said all of this, I hope that I've convinced people that there is a good place and a good reason to use modeling and simulation when possible. Um, we always hear concerns about the upfront costs of modeling or the lack of familiarity with the techniques that are available. Um, many teams don't necessarily understand the potential benefits that can come from modeling, and there's always a concern that any of the models may not be accepted by the agencies. So I hope that I've presented for you strong counter arguments for these um, myths or beliefs or concerns that come up and showed you that um, modeling and <clears throat> simulation often provides teams with objective criteria that can help support their decisions that it is in fact encouraged by the regulatory agencies that we should be using these approaches when it's appropriate and when the data will support it, um, <clears throat> that the models themselves can help understand, help teams understand the underlying physiology, which in turn can help them identify the right doses or the right study populations. It can help um, take away some of the uncertainty about the go, no-go decisions that each team eventually faces and that it can also result in significant cost savings when it's applied appropriately. Um, taking all together, that is why I hope you will start to consider how you can build in quantitative approaches into your drug development plan, or that if you have no ability to do it directly, that you'll reach out and try to get a little bit of help with it. So thank you very much. Um, this is how you can contact me if you need to. I'm part of a bigger group who will be happy to help you with your development program. And I'd like to give it back.